Hello, everyone. I hope we're all, we're all at the point where we can't wait. Hopefully, we're all eagerly awaiting the return of our Messiah, of our husband-to-be, and our Savior and our King, Yeshua, Jesus, uh, the Son of God. And this is, like it says in Hebrews 9, that we're excited about it. We're, we're really looking forward to it. This is part two about the first resurrection, and make sure you listen to part one. I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock. Be sure you do study part one. Please study part one, because I'm going to just glance at some of the highlights from part one. I will not have time, of course, to go over it again, and uh, you will not get the full foundation for this one if you don't. Please listen to part one first, okay? And But, but first of all, uh, let me say this. God wants us to be very, very concerned also about the state of affairs in our own country and in Israel, in America and Israel and around the world. And before I go too far, I want to thank all of you who have helped uh, send some funding uh, to help us with our Feast of Tabernacles coming up in Africa and Pakistan and, and other places. And among the world's poorest of the poor, we certainly couldn't do it without your help. Thank you, thank you for helping us. We still need more and uh, they, need, they need our help badly. Thank you so much. We're getting so much closer now to the seventh trumpet sounding and the first resurrection happening. Be sure you study part one. A lot's happening in the world. Before I get into this, I must say this. Part of talking about the return of Christ is this. Pray for the peace, the repentance, the revival. Pray for our nation. I know a lot's written about prophecy that's going to happen, but God told uh, Jonah that something would happen terrible in Nineveh as well. And Jonah went and preached, and the people responded. And I don't think they gave up all their idols, started keeping Sabbath, and started perfectly repenting. But God, for God, it was enough that he canceled the order to destroy Nineveh. And I am praying that all of us will be doing the same and pray that our leaders will come to God, will come to Christ, will come to revival, will come to repentance. All of our leaders. That's not a crazy suggestion. I think sometimes we get too happy to hear the, all the bad news. Oh, this must mean we're getting awful close to the day of the Lord and the return of Christ. Well, the Bible tells us in Amos, uh, where is that? In Amos, not to, uh, not to desire the day of the Lord. In fact, it says, woe to those who desire the day of the Lord. Woe to those. I'll give you the verse in a minute. So I call first on God's own people, on you, on me, to repent, which means turn around, turn from our own ways that are not right. We all have things that we're putting up with in our life that we should not be doing. We need then, after we do that, to call on God to work with our leaders as well. But it starts with us. Starts with us, you and me. 2 Chronicles 7, verses 12 to 14. Then Jehovah appeared to Solomon by night. This was when he was dedicating the temple that he had built. And God said to him, I have heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Our own lives are now the temple of God's Holy Spirit. Our own lives should be a house of prayer. Our own lives should be a house of sacrifice. And when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land or to send pestilence among my people, notice 2 Chronicles 7.14 If my people called by my name Church of God If my people, Christians called by my name will humble themselves start with us and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. There's nothing here about the nation turning from their wicked ways. If my people, of course, back then his people was, was the nation of Israel, but still, 
turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Oh, brethren, we've got to, if we're hoping for revival, it has to start with us. I want to ask you also on your own to read Ezekiel 8 and 9, where God in Ezekiel 9 puts a mark, a tav, on the foreheads of those who are crying and sighing for the abominations in the land. When was the last time in prayer on your knees that you wept for our nation? We are to seek God as Daniel did in Daniel 9. And he said, Oh God in heaven, forgive us in Daniel 9. We have been so evil, including himself, he said. And God heard that prayer. And the prophecies of Daniel 9 that are so vital were given because Daniel was fasting in sackcloth and ashes and prayer and repentance. We've got to do that. And look at Ezekiel 22, verses 29 to 31. Ezekiel 22, 29 to 31, the people of the land have used oppressions, have committed robbery and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. God is looking for someone, me, you, to say, God, please have mercy. Please don't do what you've said you're going to do. Please bring our nation to repentance. And I start with myself, oh God. No sermon about so desperately, joyously desiring the First resurrection will be complete without this message first. That we realize we have to change. We have to call on God. So he sought for a man to stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, but I found no one. Verse 31 now. Therefore, I mean Ezekiel 22, 31. Therefore, I poured out my indignation on them. I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Why? Because nobody cares enough to say, oh, God, please don't. When we call out for God to send Yeshua, Jesus Christ, to return, part of our prayer would, should be, oh, God, please don't be harsh on our nation. Hear my prayer. When was the last time you stood in any gap and said to God, oh, almighty God, please don't. Please don't. Moses did in number 16 after the Korah rebellion and the people were ready to stone Moses. And God says, get out of there, Moses. Read the end of number 16. I'm going to destroy them. Moses did not get out of there. In fact, he told, he told Aaron, grab some censers. God's killing them. Go in the midst of the plague. You don't go in the midst of a plague. You get away from a plague. Aaron ran into the middle of the plague between the living and the dead with his censer representing prayers calling out to God, stop it. Stop it, God. And God heard. And God heard Daniel. And God heard Moses after the golden calf incident. Paul said, I'd give up my own eternity that my people would be saved. When have you prayed like that about the second coming? So we talk about the return of Christ. We also have a job to do ourselves. Stand in the gap. Do it. Please do it. 
defend our nations before God, show Abba we care. You in Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, Uganda, Pakistan, do the same in your countries. And also pray for Israel. Pray for the leaders of Israel in America. We are Israel today. Show him your concern, not just exulting and delighting that all these evils must be that we are awfully close now to the return of Christ. Read Amos 5, verses 18 to 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for you'll seek light, but it will be darkness. It'll be like someone fleeing from a bear, but then runs into a lion, or maybe it's the other way around. God is just saying, don't desire what's coming. Oh, we all desire the very last part of it, the return of Christ onto the Mount of Olives and starting his reign. But before that are all kinds of seven trumpet plagues, seven last plagues, the six seals at the very beginning, seven seals, actually. Oh, wow. Don't. Amos 5, 18 to 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. So back to the first resurrection sermon, part two. I'll cover why it's a better resurrection and what happens after we're resurrected. Where do we go from there? Why do we go there? How long are we going to be there? Why are we there? How long before we actually land on the Mount of Olives? What's going on? And uh, we used to say it all happens all on the same day. The seventh trumpet, we're changed the spirit. Uh, we meet Christ in the air. Angels take us all up there. Exciting. And then we all hover around a little bit, and then we come back down to Mount of Olives. All on the same day, impossible. There's too much that has to happen still. And I'm going to show you what has to happen in this sermon, and what happens while all those things are happening. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, the last trump, and we shall be changed, and, and all of that, and we shall be those who are die, have died in Christ, shall be raised first, and then we who remain shall be caught up in the air with Christ in the air in the clouds. Okay, that has nothing to do with a pre-tribulation rapture. It's not pre-tribulation. I covered last time, and I'll give you the scripture again. Go ahead and post it. Matthew 24, verses 21 to 29, then all the way to verse 31. He says there will, there will be great tribulation, so bad the world's never seen trouble like this before. Ever, ever, ever. Boy, that's bad. The, the, the Spanish Inquisition was, sounded pretty bad to me. It will be worse. And then verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, that's the fifth seal of Revelation. The tribulation is the fifth seal of Revelation 6. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Now he's talking about the sixth seal of Revelation 6, the heavenly signs. The moon will not give its light. Stars will fall from heaven or look like a star is falling. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. All the tribes will see him. They'll mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming. Notice, on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then he sends his angels, gathers his elect from the four winds, and that's when we are raised up to be with him. Let that all sink in. It's talking about you and me taken up to the clouds where Christ is. And um, it's very important to understand that the first time he returns, he, I believe there are two phases to his return. The first phase is definitely in the clouds. We just read it in Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4. And also Acts 1, I'll be posting it now, Acts 1, verses 9 to 11, that as Jesus rose up to go to heaven um, after his first coming and resurrection, <clears throat> everybody's watching him, over 500 people, watching him go up into the clouds. And then two angels said, why are you staring up there in heaven, into the heavens? This same Jesus, whom you said, who was taken from you into heaven, will come in like manner as you saw him, uh, as you saw him go into heaven. He's going to return in the clouds on the Mount of Olives. So the first phase of his coming will definitely be in the clouds. You may not have realized this before, uh, but there's a second phase, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. 
where he's not going to be seen in the clouds, but on white charges, angelic horses. Angels can look like flying eagles, oxen, horses, frogs, all kinds of things, okay? Wings, no wings, four wings, six wings, okay? Hebrews 11.35 says there's a better resurrection. Now, I want to ask you, what makes it better? We really need to understand it. Because the point of this sermon is not just to prepare us to stand in the gap, but also to be excited, real excited, about the first resurrection and having a chance to be in it. There will be other resurrections after the first one. Otherwise, why call it the first one, the first resurrection? We're told the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are over. Revelation 20, verse 5. So why is the first resurrection better? There won't be any other resurrections until after a thousand years have passed. The things I'm about to tell you should give you great excitement. First of all, it's first, and then, uh, because only those in the first resurrection will be part of the bride of Jesus Christ. He's not marrying and remarrying and remarrying and remarrying, having a lot of wives. He has the bride of the Messiah, the bride of the King of Kings. Revelation 19 clearly speaks of the marriage of the Lamb in heaven. More coming on this. Anyone resurrected a thousand years later will not be part of the bride. They will not. It'll be too late to be part of the bride. The bride is the one who's intimately, closely working with the husband, the King of Kings. And the rest of the dead wait a thousand years. So the honor to be part of the bride, that's huge. That's only for those in the first resurrection. That means the closest possible relationship to the Son of God, who is also God. The first resurrection, another reason why it's better, is that the first resurrection is also to spirit, immortal life. Can never die again, can't be hurt. And I'll show in the sermon about some days soon I'll be giving a sermon about the second resurrection, the one after the thousand years. But they will not be resurrected to glorious immortal spirit life. No, in the Valley of the Dry Bones and all that, it talks about skin and sinews, uh, sinews and all that being put on the bones and all that. Uh, but our life in the first resurrection is immortal right off the bat. That's better than physical life, which will be the second and other possible resurrections. Revelation 20, verse 5 and 6. Uh, the rest of the dead do not live again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are, is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. We're immortal. And they shall be, here's another reason for why it's better, they will be kings and priests. They shall be priests of God in Christ. Priests and shall reign with him for a thousand years. They shall reign with him and as priests. They'll be teachers and rulers. So the first resurrection is better because we'll be leaders of the world. We'll be ones teaching them, guiding them, telling them a better way. Uh, if, if, if being in charge and being a leader doesn't excite you, how about helping? How about serving? That's leadership in God's way. How about getting in the middle of all the people needing help? Okay, these positions are reserved only for those in the first resurrection. We're already, 1 Peter 2.9 says, we're already a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation, the own people of God, his own special people. Those are descriptions of those of us who will be in the first resurrection. That's better. And also remember that those in the first resurrection, like a firstborn, Christ is the ultimate firstborn, but they're worthy of a double portion of blessings. Deuteronomy 21, 17 says. And also a huge, huge point. And I really believe this. Some of you won't, don't believe this, but I really believe this. Why it's a better resurrection. Those in the first resurrection, heavenly Jerusalem is their city. It will be my city and your city. It's the home of all those who will be in the first resurrection. It's their home city. Others will have other places they can be part of. Our citizenship is in heaven. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God as he dwelt in tents. 
That's what we're told in Hebrews 11, verses 9 to, to 10. He dwelt in tents, so verse Hebrews, 9, uh, Hebrews 11, verse 10. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, verse 10 says, uh, He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He saw that as his own city. That's our city. Hebrews 12, verses 22, 23. He's comparing what Israel, when they came to Mount Sinai, and he says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city, to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about here. To an innumerable company, innumerable company of angels. To the general assembly, church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. So, I mean, this is saying that heavenly Jerusalem is for those who are registered there, who are citizens of it, and so on. Jerusalem is even, in fact, in Revelation 21, called the bride because it's so representative of the wife of Christ. That's where the bride will live. That's where the bride will be headquartered. I believe we'll be able to zoom back and forth from earth as we reign and rule with Christ to talk to Father, to meet with Him like any father wants to talk to and be with his children. We shall see Him, for we shall be like Him. 1 John 3, 2 says, talking about God the Father, not Jesus. We shall see God, for we shall be like Him. Okay, it's kind of like a senator who works in Washington, D.C. will be working on earth. But that senator goes home a lot, back to his district in Omaha, Nebraska, or North Dakota, or wherever it is. And the same way, we will go back and forth, I believe, very strongly from earth to heavenly Jerusalem in the speed of thought. Bang, we want to be there, we'll be there. Okay? So I'm ho hoping that we all can get very, very excited about our high, high calling that we have in the first resurrection. It is indeed so special. You were born for this. This is why you were born. This is why you were called. This is why you are being chosen if you remain faithful. And of course, I still have to read all about the marriage and the wedding that will be coming up later on here. So realize it's a two-phase return. The first phase is coming in the clouds, as I said, to gather his saints. The angels gather, collect his saints. <clears throat> he resurrects the dead in Christ, then change all the still living saints into spirit beings gathered together by the angels, meet him in the clouds, and then what? We will not just hover over physical Jerusalem wondering what to do next. No, there's so much to do. So much to do. I'm going to explain that in Hebrew weddings, the groom goes back, goes to collect his bride and her attendants, and then they all go celebrating back to the groom's father's house, for the groom's father is the one putting on the wedding. Matthew 22, verse 1 and 2 is very clear about that. Kingdom of heaven. It's like a king who put on a wedding for his son. Okay, so the groom goes back to the Father. In this case, that's heaven. We pray our Father in heaven. So a lot has to happen still, as I'll show you. That when Christ returns after the wedding, he's described, when it's all said and done, of what's going to happen if there's leading an army of saints and angels, he gets on a white charger, angelic being, all the angels and saints with him on chargers, on spirit horses. We're now talking when you count the saints and the angels together. Many, 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 many millions. This is going to be huge. Stop and picture that. Coming down, you're looking up in the sky. You're just an average person on earth. You look up and you're seeing hundreds of millions of bright angels on chargers and Christ and his saints. Jude 14 says his saints are with him also. This time he's coming on chargers, not just on the clouds. That's two phases. 
Okay, first time on clouds, second time on white chargers. You'll see that as we read later on in Revelation 19. But there, there are events that must still happen after we're resurrected, according to God's word. So remember, leading up to this, in Revelation 6, you have six seals, seven, in Revelation 6, and then the seventh seal has seven trumpet plagues. The seventh trumpet of the seven trumpets is the last trump. That's when we're resurrected, okay? And then after that starts, after we're resurrected, angels give uh, seven last bold plagues to angels to pour out on the earth in Revelation 16. Okay, you may have to go back and hear that again if that's not real clear, if that was too fast. So after the seventh trump, first resurrection, we're taken by angels to meet Christ in the air. It's like we know, 1 Thessalonians 4. But then what? The often forgotten then what are the seven last bold plagues that still have to run their course here on earth before Christ and his angels and saints lands on the Mount of Olives. Let me repeat, seven seals. The seventh seal has seven trumpet plagues. The seventh trumpet is the last trump, the resurrection. And then there are seven last bowl plagues. We seem to not account for the seven last bowl plagues in the past. We're already resurrected, okay? But after we're resurrected, the seven last bowl plagues are happening. So what are we doing all that time? Where are we going? What are we doing? Just hanging around? Hovering over Jerusalem on earth? No, no, no. Revelation 15, verses 5 to 7. I'll just post it there for time's sake. I have so much to cover. After these things, and we'll read the first part of 15 later on. Revelation 15, verse 5. After these things, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came seven angels, having the seven plagues. Okay? So they're, they're, they have the seven last bold plagues, Revelation 15. And then finally, we read in Revelation 16 what those plagues are. I urge you to, after the sermon's over, carefully, slowly read Revelation 16. I'll give you the quick view right now. Revelation 16, bold plague, number one. After This is after we're already resurrected and with Christ. But on earth, we're not on earth. We're up there in the clouds, at least in the clouds. We're in heaven with Christ. Plague number one, loathsome sores. Plague number two, the seas are turned to blood and kills all the sea life. Plague number three, the fresh waters are turned to blood, kills all the other life. Where will you find water to drink? Around the world now. Plague number four, severe heat burning people. It burns them. It doesn't burn them up, but it burns them. It's so hot. So hot maybe 40, 50 degrees Celsius, maybe 130, 140, I don't know, very, very hot. Plague number five, a heavy darkness and severe pain on all those who are part of the beast system. Plague number six, in verses 12 to 16 of Revelation 16, the Euphrates River is dried up. Demons stir up the kings of the earth to come fight Christ. Battle of Armageddon. It's all in plague number six. Plague number seven, the greatest earthquake the world has ever seen, it says. Verses 17 to 21 of Revelation 16. Revelation 16, 17 to 21. 100 pound hailstones, lightnings and thunder and great earthquakes all over the world. Islands disappearing, probably because of the tsunami uh, the tsunami effect of all those powerful earthquakes. Mountains are leveled. And while these seven last plagues are going on and being poured out, what are we doing? Where are we? 
Well, remember the groom must take his fiance, his bride, back to the groom's father, his father, who we know is in heaven. The groom always took his bride to be back to the father who's putting on the wedding. I quoted earlier, let's read it, Matthew 22, verse 2. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, we know that's God the Father, who arranged a marriage for his son. We know that's Jesus Christ. In heaven, it says, kingdom of heaven. The king arranges the wedding. Where's the king? Of course he's in heaven. Our father who art in heaven. Going to heaven? Yeah. Yeah. King is in heaven. That's what we pray, our Father in heaven. Jesus has to take his bride back to the Father. So the Father meets them face to face. We shall be like him and we shall see him, 1 John 3, 2 says. Okay? And it's also what happened with Isaac's marriage to Rebekah in Genesis 24. A messenger, a servant of Abraham, depicting an angel or angels, went to collect a bride for Isaac, and he selected, God led him to select Rebekah and her attendants. They came back on ten camels. He went out into the field, Genesis 24, away from his tents and home, and there he meets Rebekah coming back at the end of Genesis 24. And... He takes her back to where his father was. And there he sees Sarah's tent. Sarah has died. Sarah is Isaac's mother. And she has died. But her tent is still up. Sarah's tent, we find out, represents Jerusalem above. Really study this. A little more time. Galatians 4 said Abraham had two boys, two sons, Ishmael from a slave woman, Hagar and Isaac from a free woman, Sarah. Ishmael came from his own physical work and efforts. Isaac came from faith in God's word and promise when it was impossible to have babies. God still did it. Picturing, again, the, the new covenant is by faith in God, in Christ. Galatians 4, verses 25 and 26. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, not in Sinai Peninsula, in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, earthly Jerusalem, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above, heavenly Jerusalem, okay, is free, which is the mother of us all. Just as Sarah was mother of Isaac, heavenly Jerusalem is the mother of us all. Genesis 24, verse 67. Genesis 24, verse 67. Then Isaac brought her, Rebekah. Let's have both of these up, Galatians 4 and Genesis 24 at the same time. And then Isaac brought her, Rebekah, into his mother's, Sarah's, into his mother Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah and she became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted. In other words, they got married in the tent. They consummated in the tent of Sarah, pictured by heavenly Jerusalem, according to Galatians 4, verse 25 and 26. Are you getting it? We're going to heaven, folks. After the tribulation, before the seven last plagues are poured out, but as they're being poured out, we're up in heaven heaven. We're, we got to get married, but before that, or even whether it's before or after the wedding, there are things that we will be doing. Christ, a type of Isaac, a type of Christ, I mean, and Rebecca, picturing the church, became husband and wife in Sarah's tent, and Sarah pictured heavenly Jerusalem. So here again, we have yet another picture, Isaac and Rebecca going to heaven. And we have Matthew 22, a certain king. That king is in heaven, putting on a wedding. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who put on a wedding for his son. So this idea, if any of you question that we're going to go to heaven or not, it is so plain. Open your eyes. It's right there. Please, please, I'll open your eyes. Pray your eyes be open. 
Weddings are also tied to Pentecost. Another indication that the first resurrection is more likely to happen on Pentecost than it is to happen in the fall. The first resurrection, remember, is all about and only about, only about the first fruits. The only holy day, what we're told over and over and over and over, about five times or so, that it's about the first fruits is Pentecost. There were first fruits in the fall of the olives and the vineyard and so on, but they're not really talked about. But the feast, the day of first fruits is Pentecost. Now, wedding, the weddings at the Pentecost were frequent. God married Israel around the Pentecost season in Exodus 19, 20 to 24, and so on. The marriage of Boaz and Ruth was after the barley harvest and as the wheat harvest, the first fruits of the wheat were being gathered, if you study it. That was Pentecost. Boaz pictures Christ. Ruth pictures the church. Pentecost in Acts 2. They, it's also called Feast of Weeks, remember. Pentecost in Acts 2, they were given the earnest, the down payment of the Holy Spirit, the Arabon, the earnest, the guarantee that God will finish what he started. In Greece today, the word for engagement ring is a very similar word, Arabona, with an A on the end. Arabon means down payment. Arabona, of course, means engagement ring. It's a down payment. You will finish what you promised to do to marry this person. In the picture of Isaac marrying and consummating his marriage in Rebekah's tent, we got that already. We have the two leaven loaves of Pentecost that are elevated, raised up to heaven. I think that's Leviticus 23, 17. I think it is. I think that's the verse. And God says, these are the first fruits to Jehovah, to the Lord. And they're raised up to heaven. Matthew 22, I already said that several times. Certain, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who put on a wedding for his son, a marriage for his son. The fathers always put on the wedding. Where in the universe could you possibly have a wedding suitable for God's son, for God who's putting it on, than in heavenly Jerusalem with a sea of glass right there? 1 Peter 1, verse 3 to 4. Now notice where Peter says, our reward is reserved. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. I'm trying to make the ironclad point. We are going to heaven. I don't believe in a pre-trib rapture. I believe after the tribulation, before the seven, uh, or as even the seven last plagues are being poured out. Yes, we go to heaven to do a lot of things I'm about to talk about. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 and 4. I hope you're getting excited. I hope you are. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. We're being begotten, being born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved, reserved in heaven for you. And it just gets better and better. By this time, we know that in Revelation eleven fifteen, I read last time, the seventh trumpet sounded, and we're all resurrected, and we all meet Christ. But where are the 144,000? Are they still on earth in the clouds? No, 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 no. Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. And then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay? Yehovah, or whatever, uh, Yehovah's son, or something, whatever it's going to say. And I heard a voice, where? From heaven. Like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. 
This is happening in front of God. This is happening in front of the throne of God. And before the four living creatures and the elders, the 24 elders, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They're not still on the earth. They're from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are, they are virgins. Uh, they are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They shall forever be with him. Okay, These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits. These are the elect, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Remember the two wave loaves, leaven loaves? God said, for these are the first fruits to Jehovah, to God. It says here the 144,000 are in heaven, in front of God's throne, in front of the 24 elders, in front of the four living creatures, and they are first fruits redeemed from the earth, from among men. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault. Why are they without fault? Because all their faults were given to Jesus. And his righteousness are given to us. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who had no sin, okay, became sin for us. And that we might become the righteousness of God in, in him, in Christ. Now, in their mouth was found no deceit. Revelation 14, verse 5. For they are without fault before, in front of, the throne of God, where is that? That's not on some portable sea of glass hovering over physical earth. No, 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 no. We're in heaven above. Before the throne of God the Father. Throne of God. God the Father doesn't come down to earth at all yet. Not yet. Not for a thousand years yet. We go to him. Which Holy Day talks a lot about first fruits? Obviously, Pentecost does, okay? And where are these thrones of God? In the thrones of the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Revelation 4 makes it very, very clear that these are all in heaven where God the Father is. I'll have to move quickly, and so we'll have to read these verses quickly. Read Revelation 4 yourself to see where all of these people or these beings are. I'm going to read Revelation 4, verses 2, 4, and 6 only for time's sake. Immediately, John says, I was in the Spirit, verse 2, Revelation 4, verse 2. And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Okay, he's in heaven. Verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders. Verse 6, and before or in front of the throne was a sea of glass, like his crystal. This is a huge sea of glass. It has to be big enough to be the meeting point for hundreds of millions of angels. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and back. It goes on describing them and how they say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever, verse 9, I'll go ahead and read that. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, okay, um, to, the, uh, to the 24 elders, then the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, worship him who lives forever and ever. They fall down, okay, and cast their thrones, bef their crowns before the throne. Okay, so where are the 24 elders? Where are they? Where the four living creatures with the six wings. Where's the sea of glass? They're all in heaven. As Revelation 4, 1 says, and, re and the 144,000 that we read are in heaven, in front of God's throne, in heaven. Now let's look at Revelation 15, the first four verses, or three verses, whatever. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God. This is now God's wrath, not Satan's wrath. 
is complete. Now, we're not going to go through God's wrath. We won't be on earth during, for God's wrath. We're in heaven now. That's what it says. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. They didn't give in to 666. Standing on the sea of glass, the complete Jewish Bible says standing by or beside the sea of glass, whether it's on or beside, they're there where the sea of glass is, having harps of God. And notice that these are the ones who did not succumb to 666. At this point, it says they're in heaven. Verse 1, I saw another sign, in heaven. And he sees the sea of glass. And we read in Revelation 4 that the sea of glass is in heaven. Verse 3, Revelation 15, 3, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, in the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord? And glorify your name. You alone are holy. All the nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. We're not on just some sort of portable sea of glass. We're up there in heaven where God the Father is. Before the throne of God, the sea of glass is in heaven. Why do we need all this time in heaven? This is very important. I was talking to another elder back in California. And um, the saints are all spirit beings in heaven. Remember this. Why? What are we doing all that time up there in heaven? We'll be outside of time and space. I don't fully understand that. It's beyond my pay grade. But somehow things can be happening for thousands of years here and just be moments up there or vice versa. It can seem like thousands of years with God. It'd be moments here. A thousand years is as a day, right? The saints are all spirit beings outside of time and space. In earth time, we're likely going to be up there for about three months. Or the time between Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets. The time between the resurrection at Pentecost and then the return again back to earth on the Mount of Olives. About three months, give or take a few days. And Christ returns, I believe, probably on the Feast of Trumpets. It'll be almost impossible to tell which day it is by then. Dark clouds and gloominess. And probably the satellites, as we know today, that tell us time. Our smart watches, our cell phones, our garage doors, our cars, our tanks, our airplanes. They may all be destroyed, the satellites might be very hard to tell what day it is with everything being dark. But anyway, I believe around the Feast of Trumpets, Christ will return. We'll all be spirit beings with, with him in heaven in the meantime. Why does God need us to go to heaven first? Besides the wedding, we know that. I'll talk about that also. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to learn. A lot to get ready for. For when we return to earth, there must be no confusion. We must work as one. I'm telling our men in Kenya, in Malawi, in Tanzania, work as one, become one. Be so united, you're like stagecoach horses all pulling together that horse, I mean that stagecoach. Work together in harmony. No more gossip. No more putting each other down. No more trying to seek the advantage over the others. Work together. We have to learn that. We're learning that now on earth, but you'll see what I mean. The seven last plagues of take going on in, on earth. Okay, this will last a few months. Other reasons for spending time on earth, I mean on, in heaven with God our Father and Jesus Christ our husband, in the third heaven. We have to meet our Father. I've said that earlier, but I'll say it again. We have to meet our Father. No doubt we'll be given a tour of this heavenly Jerusalem, which is so big it would cover one half of the United States and be many, many times higher than Mount Everest, which is only, what, five or six miles high. 
this is 14, 15, I think it's 1,400 miles high. Other reasons for spending time with God our Father in heaven, uh, besides meeting Father, is surely we have to be taught how to use our new spirit body so we don't go crashing into the whole universe or, or, or disappearing and I, unable to stop and turn and all that. When I was teaching my girls how to ski, we, the first thing I always would teach them is once you get on the skis, how do you stop? How do you stop it? How do you turn? How do you turn and stop? How do you turn around? Okay, we have to know how to use these powers. Surely we'll have to have Maybe you don't think we do need lessons. I think we'll need lessons. How to fly safely. Practice and rehearse until there's no doubt that we're safe with these new powers. I think that's the reason the holy angels come down to gather us up because they're saying, oh, don't touch a thing. I'm going to take you to Yeshua, Christ. So the, so the angels take us up to him. Kind of like zip lining before you get on the zip line. They give you a couple things. Now remember to do this. Remember to do that so you don't go crashing into the tree at the end of this. And that's a lot of fun. But yeah, you got to know how to slow things down, how to speed it up and so on. And uh, so can you imagine what that will be like? Uh, if, if we didn't know all this and we just proceeded to the Mount of Olives, we don't know how to use our, our new spirit bodies. We don't know what we're supposed to do next and who, we're, who with and all that. No, it's not going to be that way. God is not the author of confusion, not at all. So while we're there, no doubt we'll get to meet the resurrected other elect and saints and prophets. Imagine meeting face to face with our Abba, our dear Father, and to meet face to face with your guardian angel, and meet other angels, to meet the 24 elders, to meet the four living creatures, to meet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Rebecca, and Sarah and Rachel and Leah and all the different ones, the resurrected Israel and his sons and their wives. How exciting. Can you not get excited about the first resurrection? Plus meeting Moses and listening to them, explaining what it was like, talking to Noah, explaining what it was like in the, in the flood. Meeting Peter, Paul, John, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew, all of them. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus. All of them. Wow, I can't wait. That will take some time. We'll be outside time and space, so to us, we can take all the time in the world it takes. The King of Kings will have to now also explain our game plan. The battle plan for when we return. There will be a battle when we return. He comes back as a man of war, it says in Revelation 19. What each of us will be doing, and I'll be doing, what you'll be doing. Who we'll be working with? Who we'll be teammates with? What our job assignments will be? Where we'll be assigned when we return to earth? What will happen once we land on the Mount of Olives? What we do next and next and next? So we'll be ready, maybe even rehearsed, and know exactly how to do our job perfectly. There won't be any confusion. So we have to go to heaven, learn all that with everybody else who will be resurrected. At the same time, everyone else in the first resurrection, all the saints and prophets, will be outside time and space, so we can take all the time we want. While we're in heavenly Jerusalem, the angels, maybe Christ himself, will show us each of us our new mansion that he has designed for us. Knowing you and what you like, he's made a mansion just for you. John 14, 1 to 3, don't let yourselves be disturbed. I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible now, translation. Trust in God, trust in me. In my Father's house are many places to live, many mansions. If there weren't, I would have told you, but because I am going there to prepare a place for you. I'm going there to get your house ready, to get a place for you there. That's your city. That's going to be your home. You'll work on earth. 
you'll zip back and forth many times, I'm sure, to heavenly Jerusalem. Verse 3, since I am going and preparing a place for you, I will return to take you with me, so that where I am you may also be. And he's going to return with his bride to the father, like all grooms did with their bride, to the one who's putting on the wedding, which is the father of the groom. Heavenly Jerusalem is one huge, huge city. It cover half the size of the United States. Much of Africa, if we put it right over Africa. And in that city, you have your own home. Kenyans, imagine it won't be a mud hut anymore with straw tops or a rented home. It's going to be a gorgeous home. A big home in your own city, heavenly Jerusalem. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, Hebrews 11.10. For he, Abraham, waited for the city who has foundation, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So all this will take time. Learning how to work together, learning our bodies, learning our job assignments, getting used to our home too, and enjoying it. Meeting our teammates, meeting everyone, meeting, seeing our new home. And then, sometime between Pentecost and the Fall Holy Days, or maybe right after Pentecost, I don't know exactly when, one more thing happens. We must get married. Christ is not coming back as a single being. He's coming back married. We hope to be the bride of the marriage of the Lamb, described in Revelation 19. I believe all this happens right after Pentecost. On the wedding, can you imagine being seated in the heavenly Jerusalem, dining room, perhaps even set up on the sea of glass, being served by angels, and what is heavenly food like? I don't know. Dream a little. I don't think it'll just be angel food cake. <laughs> Dream a little. Get excited. Our table waiters will be angels. And maybe even a little surprise. Luke 12, 37 hints that somewhere, sometime, we might even see Jesus serving. It's a bit unclear exactly when and how that happens, but Luke 12, 37 wouldn't surprise me. During this time in heaven, I wouldn't be surprised if God decides to also do some other things. Maybe during the wedding ceremony, or I'm sorry, during the dinner. Maybe that's the time, or maybe a separate ceremony, when we each will be given our new name. Mentioned in Revelation 3.12. Our dear Father, our Messiah, loves to name people the way he sees them as they are. So Simon becomes Peter, meaning small rock or, or stone. Abram becomes Abraham, father of many nations. Sarah becomes Sarai, princess. Jacob, meaning supplanter, was changed. No, we don't want you being a cheat and a supplanter. We want you Israel, Prince of God, ruler with God. I wonder what your name will be. It'll be fabulous because Yeshua will explain why he picked that name for you. Probably give a story. Remember, we have all the time in the world for this. As to why he picked this name for you in front of everybody else. Some will be given a private name written on a stone, like the Pergamos Church. Some will be given a name that everybody hears. I'm sure it's going to be very, very moving. Very emotional time. King, you want to call me that? Wow. Thank you. Whatever that is. I mean, one of the disciples was renamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. What a lovely name. Son of encouragement. Revelation 3, 3, 3, 12. <laughs> Revelation 3.12. He who overcomes. We must overcome. We must not live with the sins we have. 
We must be winners and victorious through the blood of Christ, through his power. To him who overcomes, Revelation 3.12, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Why would you do that? Because that's our city. Get that. Some of us believe that the city itself is made also completely of spirit. Why go to physical when spirit is the real thing? So the, the streets of gold will be spirit gold. I really believe that. It will all be spirit. I believe. If you don't agree with me, fine. We'll see. But write on him the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write on him my new name. Everywhere we go, we'll be identified as new name, given by God, of the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, son of God, daughter of God, God's name on us, city's name on us, our new name on us. The Pergamos group, for example, also gets a new name in Revelation 2.17. Theirs is written privately on a stone. So it's going to be a very, very exciting time. A time of learning, a time of growing, a time of seeing, meeting various ones. Get excited! A time of watching the glory of heaven going by, mesmerized as you will be by millions of angels, holy, glorious angels, some looking like what we call animals today, like horses. We'll be riding on some spirit chargers like flying eagles, like cows or bulls or, or whatever, different things. It's going to be a glorious time seeing angels coming and going, some with four wings, some with six. We're going to be there standing in awe about all of this. What's going on? Others will want to meet you. Listening to angelic choirs. There'll be times when we all bow down. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. As we watch the 24 elders cast their crowns before him. And if we've been given a crown, maybe we'll cast ours before him also. Then later go pick it up again. Now then, we got to get married to Yeshua, our Savior, whose name means salvation of Yah. Salvation of Yah. Turn to Psalm 45. I get excited about this. I hope you don't mind me feeling, showing a little emotion. I've been so imperfect. I've had so many sins that God has forgiven. To even think that I'd ever be worthy of any of this. Praise him. Praise you, Yah. Praise you, Father. Psalm 45. We're the royal daughter of the Almighty God, the Supreme King. We're ready now to come and marry Yahshua, Yeshua, the Son of God. Jesus will be married king when he returns. He'll be a married king. No more appropriate place than in heaven. Psalm 45, verses 12 to 15. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. There's no palace on earth. After all, the greatest earthquakes the world has ever seen have, gone, have happened. Everything on earth will be destroyed and we'll have to rebuild. But there is a palace. There is a temple. There is a sea of glass. There is a heavenly Jerusalem. The royal daughter is all glorious in her, within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions, her attendants who follow her, shall be brought to you with gladness and rejoicing. They shall be brought. They shall enter the king's 
palace. Revelation 19, verse 1 says, The loud voices were heard in heaven. Let's pick up in verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, which means praise Yah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. That's God the Father. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb. That's the Son of God who puts on this wedding. The marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. We made ourselves ready by repenting and accepting Yeshua as our Savior and letting him live righteously inside of us, fighting and defeating the thoughts that are against him, bringing every thought into captivity. As it says, where is that? Second Corinthians 10, I think. But anyway, let us be glad. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice. Verse 8, to her it was granted, given to her, to be arrayed in fine linen. The fine linen is the righteousness. It was granted to her. God imputes his righteousness. Romans 5.17 is the gift of his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we become the righteousness of God by faith in Christ. Okay, it's imputed to us. It's granted to her to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. It should, if you look at the Greek, it is righteousness of the saints. It's not the righteous acts of the saints. We are not saved by any of our works or acts. It's the righteousness of the saints, which is the righteousness of God given to us, poured out on us. Believe that. That's scriptural. When you really let Christ live in you, you will obey. You will live righteously. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Happy, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Finally, when the wedding is done, our king, our husband, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, hallelujah, he will stand up and he'll say it's time. It's time to take over the reins of rulership on the earth itself. It's time to lock up Satan, the deceiver. The adversary. He's our only adversary. We're not each other's adversary. Let's quit acting like we are. He is the adversary. He's going to say it's time to go down to earth, take over the reins of power, lock up the adversary. So mount up, everyone. Mount up. Your angelic charges are waiting for you by the hundreds of thousands and millions of, and whether the angels themselves will also be on other angels or just come directly, maybe they'll just come directly. But let's get going. As I explained to you before, let's make it happen. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. This white horse is an, an angel, a powerful angel. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. To remind us who he was, what he did. And his name, here we know this name, his name, the one who's going to come back, is not God the Father yet. His name is the Word of God. We know who the Word is. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh, John 1 tells us. This is Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, and the armies in heaven. Those are the angels clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Jude 14 says it includes his saints. The saints also come back with him. Out of his mouth goes a fire, a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, the ones that are gathered to fight him, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. 
And he himself, the first time he came to earth as a little baby, as a suffering servant, as a, as a sacrifice, as a lamb to be killed. This time he's coming as the Son of God. He was Son of God back then, but this time Son of God, the Lion of Judah, King of Kings. Get excited. Repent for losing your excitement. If you have, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So he's being sent on behalf of God Almighty. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. We know this name. King of kings. Lord of lords. King of what kings? You will be the other kings he's king of. You will be the Lord he's lord of. All the other kings of the earth are taken down. King of his righteous kings, which is you. Revelation 19, 19, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. The beast was captured, the false prophet also, thrown in the lake of fire. The rest were killed. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Then he commands an angel to grab the, the adversary, Satan, tie him up, put him into the bottomless pit for a, uh, for a thousand years. And now finally we're on earth. Finally. The thousand year reign is about to begin. We'll start in Jerusalem, just as Christ told his apostles in Acts 1 and 2. Start there and then fan out. Take my good news to every creature around the earth. Win them over. Remember, the earth up until this time has seen this invasion from outer space. They don't fully understand it. And we destroyed their kings and their armies. They'll have to be won over. We'll have to win over hearts and minds. Not by commanding them, but by winning them over, I believe. By servant leadership. By restoring amputated limbs. By healing the sick and the wounded. By restoring and reuniting families that were divided by war. You and I will be spirit beings with great power. We'll be able to make food appear and feed them if they haven't eaten for a while. We'll be able to say, look, guys, I know we fought your armies, but we're different now. Look, watch. We're going to feed you. We're going to heal you. We're going to help you. Someone says, I've lost my son. I think he's still alive, but I don't know where. Some of the angels that are around us will say, we know where they are or where he is. We say, angel, go get him. Boom, the boy's right back. Reunited to his mom. Do you think it'll take too long to win the world over? I don't think so. I think we're going to win the world over. During the Feast of Tabernacles, there were 70 bulls that were sacrificed. On each day, 13 and 12 and 11 and so on. You can read all about that Revelation in Numbers 29. 70 bulls. By day seven of the feast, one bull was left. I'm sorry, seven bulls. Seven bulls, making 70 total. Then on the eighth day, separate feast, there was one bull. All that has meaning. We'll talk about that some other time. But 70 bulls pictured how God sees the 70 nations of the world. Originally, there were 70 nations. I think that's in Genesis 10. God is so good. Father in heaven... Father in heaven, send. Please don't delay any longer. Send Yeshua back. And help us to repent. Turn our ways back to you. Lead our nations to repent. I will take a miracle. Turn our leaders. Protect them. Watch over them. Turn their hearts to you. Let's dismiss. 
Heavenly Father in heaven, we raise our hands and worship to you, reaching up like a child does to his father. Reach down and pick us up. Shine your face upon us. We receive your blessing. And we ask you to please help us be there. Help us be found worthy to be in that first resurrection. In Christ, in Yeshua. We praise you, dear Father. We praise you, Yeshua, our King, our husband-to-be. Forgive us for losing our excitement, for falling asleep, for being late of seeing. We repent. We open the door to you, for you are here knocking on our door. We thank you, we praise you, we love you, Yeshua, Jesus. We love you, Father. Thank you for this truth you've given us, that we will be in heaven. We'll be our city. We'll be ready to rule. You'll prepare us to rule. No confusion. How exciting. In Yeshua Jesus' mighty name we pray. We always pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. So be it, Lord. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.